In this session tonight, we're going to explore some uh, theory to organizing and, and what we're doing tonight is just an introduction by looking at some of the roots and some of the branches of, of the theory ar around community and workplace organizing. While I do aim to introduce some concepts, it's probably true to say that almost everything in this presentation is contested by um, by committed organizers who have experience, who have been there, done that, done the, got the t-shirt to prove it, who would not agree with everything that's uh, with all the content. No, that's okay. Some of that content, some of that contention may come out during and after this session. If it does, it can only enhance our understanding of the issues. Do remember that this is an introduction and a way to push the boat out, so it isn't as comprehensive as we'd all like. So Saul Alinsky was an important and influential advocate of community organizing, but he's been criticized both for his assertion that politics and organizing don't mix when, when really they do. He was anti-ideology, you see, and because of his very limited focus on agency. His first project was in the 1930s when he worked with labor unions to organize in, in back of yards districts of Chicago. He wrote two books, The Revival for Radicals, probably his best book, and Rules for Radicals, which, while his most famous, not his best work. Interestingly, given the way that some people have turned his method into a rigid set of rules, he once said that one of the most important things in life is that ever gnawing in a doubt as to whether you're right. If you don't have that, if you think you've got an inside track to absolute truth, you become doctrinaire, humorless and intellectually constipated. He claimed that the job of the organiser is to manoeuvre and bait the establishments. It will publicly attack them as a dangerous enemy. The hysterical uh, instant reaction of the establishment will not only validate the organizer's credentials for competence, but also ensure automatic popular invitation. On many occasions, Alinsky himself managed to bait the establishment in a way that caused them to look foolish. However, the advent of PR consultants probably makes that tactic harder to pull off today. In retrospect, the Alinsky method has been criticized for using communities as stage armies, if you like, brought on for effect or to be pitied, but never actually placed in the driving seat of the campaign when actually modern organizing requires that, that, that the workers and the community are put front and center and they're trusted to make the right decision. Whatever criticisms there are of Alinsky, however, in his model, it has been a very influential, possibly too influential, um, uh, blueprint, which is one reason we want to look at alternative sources of organizing theory and practice. Now, the, the Flint sit down strike, uh, Linsky himself was inspired by both uh, the mob. He actually studied the sociology of gangs in Chicago for his PhD and by his mentor, John L. Lewis, a complex and controversial trade union leader. Traditionally, trade unions in the US have been, been craft based attempts to build unity across trades in a particular industry had repeatedly failed. However, with the launch of the UAW, the United Auto Workers Union, this changed and led to the formation of the CIO, the Congress of the Industrial Organization. And uh, CIO is uh, one half of the main general workers union in the States. The way this became possible was through the sit down strike the 36-37 Flint sit-down strike against General Motors transformed the UAW from a collection of the United Auto Workers from a collection of isolated local branches on the fringes of the industry into a major labor union. This led to the unionization of the, of the domestic United States automobile industry. The union won a 5% pay increase and recognition in a hostile environment. Membership went from, th from, from 30,000 to half a million members in just 12 months. The militancy of the American labor movement was a major player in organizing campaigns for social justice across America. Sparked by the arrest of Rosa Parks on the 1st of December 1955, the Montgomery bus boycott was a 13 month mass protest that ended with the, US, with the US Supreme Court ruling that segregation on public buses was not constitutional. Interestingly, one of the background figures on the bus boycott was E.D. Nixon. A leading civil rights activist and organizer of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the union of the black staff who worked on the interstate sleeper trains. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters took what they learned for the union and gave their financial support, knowledge, strategies, tactics and work to these three civil rights events. The Montgomery Improvements Organization mobilized 40,000 bus boycotters in a matter of days. 
Now, the Montgomery bus boycott demonstrated the potential for non-violent direct action and mass protest to successfully challenge racial segregation and served as an example for other Southern campaigns that followed. The campaign was the spark that gave rise to the civil rights movement. Just as an aside, luck actually has a fair amount to do with uh, how successful these campaigns are. Montgomery Improvement Association could not reach the whole of the dispersed black community uh, by themselves. However, articles in the newspapers were read by white people who employed domestic servants. They then, uh, in, in their infinite wisdom, lectured their employees on why they should not join the bus boycott. Now, this was the fir that's first many of them actually heard about it and they made it their business to find out more. So luck has a lot to do with it. But these days, what I think we'll find is that uh, rather than give um, th these campaigns exposure, that the media of today just um, just pretend it isn't happening and completely ignore it. Now, this brings us to Ella Baker herself. She was a veteran civil rights organizer and worked for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, SNCC, pronounced SNCC. Ella Baker began her involvement with NAACP in 1940. She worked as a field secretary and then served as director, director of branches from 43 to 56, taking dangerous journeys across southern states determined to recruit organizers and build branches. She attended the famous Highlander School activist training and was involved in developing their training programs, including those that trained young people in the 1960s voter registration drives. In 57, she moved to Atlanta, Georgia, to help organize Martin Luther King's new organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and helped expand its focus beyond buses to ending all forms of segregation, and eventually um, ending up with the in, abolishing the uh, abolishing uh, segregation in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, the uh, Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, was one of the most important organizations of the civil rights movement in the 60s and emerged from a student meeting organized by Ella Baker held at Shaw University in April 1960. Her main contribution to the style of organizing, she once said, is to shine a light and the people will find a way. And then undisguised criticism of the Messianic leadership of Martin Luther King, and arguably can be applied to the Messianic leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, um, strong people do not need strong leaders. Strong people do not need strong leaders. Now, these are the United Farm Workers of America, the UFW, undertaking a pilgrimage during their strike of 1966. They were joined by 8,000 workers on the last leg of their 350-mile pilgrimage as they entered the state capital. The California-based UFW organized boycotts to support their strikes and won major concessions from farm owners and, and an industry that had systematically prevented organizing in the fields for generations. The UFW was influenced for good and bad by the Alinsky model, and celebrations after its remarkable early successes must be accompanied by recognition of its later failings. And I'm sure that we'll uh, have another webinar on that at another time. Many Mexican women in California who joined the UFW in the 60s were uh, were already involved in community-based activism but through the community service organization for Latino civil rights. The, the racial discrimination and economic disadvantages they faced from a young age made it necessary to form networks of support to empower Latinos in America with voter registration drives, citizenship classes, lawsuits and legislative campaigns and political protests against police brutality and, and immigration policies. It was this combination of trade unionism and civil rights activism that made the UFW unique. Now, a, a very famous activist called Jessica Gavea, one of the union's most powerful organizers, is, it, is in the center of the front row. Now, co uh, common features of organizing, there are many approaches to organizing and many trends that go with it. There are civil rights, workers' rights, environmental and community-based initiatives, but perhaps some common features are oppression or injustice, which represents a challenge, something that needs to be changed. Resistance is a response to the challenge, which is something other than mere endurance. Organizing implies there is a strategy, but as we'll see, often the resistance and the nature of the injustice itself begin to shape a movement before a strategy becomes clearly defined. Attempting to create a mass movement 
one of, one of the central divisions within organizing comes from the role of leadership with respect to individual agency. Marshall Gans, Marshall Gantz places the development of leadership among the masses as central su to success as good leaders create more leaders. While some still believe that good leaders attract lots of followers, in either case, organizing requires numbers and actually having um, creating more leaders actually uh, reduces the workload on, on one individual person. Also, the transformation of, of the balance of power. Again, there are disagreements about this, but organizing seeks not just to win an individual demand, like votes for women, for example, but a substantial and long-term redistribution of power from the few to the many. And then one of, one of the best features of organizing is success. It's not just about mere protesting, it's about winning and extracting concessions. Organizers weep when they see people going through ritualized behavior like signing a petition, calling a one day protest strike or picketing a council meeting without working out how these tactics take us forward towards a victory or victories. Doug McAdam, Douglas McAdam studied the rise and fall of the American freedom, the African American freedom movement and developed what became known as political process theory or PPT, P political process theory. You, you might want to um, get yourself, um, on a side note, you, you might want to get a, uh, a notepad and a pen so you can uh, write all these things down. It's regarded as the, uh, now PPT is regarded as the core theory of social movements and how they are able to affect change. It was developed further by sociologists in America in the 70s and 80s in response to the civil rights, anti-war, women's, LGBT plus and student movements. During the 1950s, the African-American community was excluded from the political process by, by the Jim Crow laws and there was no strategy for change, resulting in very little hope. That's not to say heroic work wasn't being done by people simply would not stay quiet and do nothing, but because because work was being done at the time. Political opportunities or opportunities for intervention and change within the existing political system arise when the system experiences vulnerabilities. The change unleashed by the African and American civil rights movement was in part because political opportunities arose. One aspect of the Cold War between the the US and the USSR was competition for the moral high ground with respect to human rights. The oppression of the Southern black community was an embarrassment for the US in this respect because it, it, it exposed the hypocrisy of the land of the free, which the civil rights movement could exploit to gain leverage and exploit it, they did. On strategy of a local chapter, the NAACP led by the trade unionist E.D. Nixon was to convert the black church networks into organizing centers. According to the theory, Pre-existing organizations serve as mobilizing structures for a social movement by providing membership, leadership and communication and social networks to the to the building movement. The church played this role in the early stages of the civil rights era, African-American freedom movement. And Martin Luther King, he framed the essentially political struggle for justice as a fulfillment of the religious belief of many of the early participants. So religion did play a big role in, on that score. Now, now I'll talk about uh, mobilization theory and John Kelly. The UK academic John Kelly extended political process theory, PPT, to look at trade union struggles. He devised a set of principles and factors that are normally present in successful trade union mobilizations. It has to be a sense of injustice. People have to believe that they are not just unlucky or unfortunate, that they have to have been actually wronged. Now, attribution, someone has to be to blame. This is related to the first point, but unless you can hold someone responsible or something responsible, it's very difficult to see how things can change. We all complain about the weather, but no one has built a mass movement for a few rainy days, of course. Now, what's needed is a coherent and widespread counter narrative because, quite frankly, in this day and age, um, narrative building and counter narratives are all that really matters if we're going to achieve our goals. Describing a situation in, in a way that differs from the official version and disseminating this counter narrative effectively is one way in which the sense of injustice is shaped because everyone can articulate what's wrong. It becomes a widespread belief that A, things should change and A, things can change. And what's needed is a clearly articulated strategy. Very few people want to get involved in campaigns that have little or no chance of success. If you want me to add, as opposed to simply have any sympathy for your reduction, then, then the, the, the people we're trying to help need to know how and why their participation will help achieve the objectives and 
the uh, potential participants need to feel they have the potential to win. The cost benefit analysis also has to make sense. For example, if if Unite, for example, asks me to take one day of strike action with the, with the expectation that I will win a 10% pay rise, I'm going to have, have to be keen as, as we have to be some sort of incentive to do this. But if they want me to take 10 days of strike action in the belief that we may win a 1% pay rise, then I, for one, would think twice about uh, taking strike action if I if the uh, law of diminishing returns dictates that I won't get that bigger concession out of the employer, just as an example. Mobilizing versus organizing uh, based on uh, the life, life's work of Jane McCallavy. Now, this is where things get a little bit complicated. Jane McCallavy makes a distinction between organizing and mobilizing, whereas John Kelly does not. Mobilizing is getting your existing base to shout a little louder. It works fine for small for small wins, but it's not a transformational approach. Jane McCallavy's distinction, deep organizing, is about transforming the power structure or tipping the balance of power back in the favor of the many by increasing far more people's participation levels, including those of the previously uncommitted. That's when a supermajority, something in the region of 80% support, you need to work with natural leaders who initially may well disagree with you. And this is the big distinction in, in the McCavely, um blueprint for organizing. Rather than train your most committed existing supporters to become leaders, you find organic leaders, those who already have other people's respect and confidence, and turn them into your most committed supporters. Now, this is the most effective way to win the contested middle and achieve that supermajority. Now, Jane McCavley distinguishes between, ad, in, in deep organizing, she distinguishes between advocacy, which is done by third party experts on behalf of the people affected by the injustice, mobilizing, which involves maximizing the activity of already committed activists who are often a minority or a bare majority, and deep organizing, which places the agency for success with a continually expanding base of ordinary people in order to create a super majority. Now, easy wins on small issues with little impact on the targets can be achieved without deep organizing. But it's hard to know whether an issue is an easy win or is an easy win or not. Now, these are some questions that need to be asked before and during each campaign. If you can't answer these questions, your campaign is likely to fail or flounder. You need to be able to identify who holds the power, what leverage you have to challenge that power and, and create your own source of power. Now, in, in the next webinar, I hope to cover this in a little more detail. The approach to these questions can reveal the difference between transactional and transformational organizing. For example, suppose you're a trade unionist seeking a, a rise in pay, you might take one of two approaches. Say to the employer, we will agree up to a speed up of work or an increase in targets in exchange for an increase in pay. Now, this is transactional. You have something they want, higher output, and they have something you want, which is higher pay. But, but a transformational approach might mean recognizing the employer is taking a high profit, but paying low wages because they can get away with it. The reason being that we are not well organized. By recruiting people into the union and achieving a super majority for action, we can say to the boss, give us a pay rise or we'll suffer a, a work stoppage. Suddenly, the power relationship has changed. Now, I believe this is all I've got time for for now. And um, what, I, what I can recommend is it, it, checking out the Ella Baker School of Organizing and uh, and their series of webinars that they, that they do like um, two, three, maybe even four times a week. And um, what we'll do tonight is we're going to, what, what I'll do is, is provide a, a few more details on what Ella Baker is all about. So yeah, th th thank you very much.